I want to talk to you tonight about the, how you are empowered for service. That God has a power source for you and I that is intended for us to rise up and to be who he's created us to be. For if you're a husband, for you, you have a power source to be a godly husband. If you're a wife, you have a power source to be a godly wife. If you are uh, uh, you know, parents, you have the godly source to be parents. You have the godly source to be a son, a daughter. You have godly source to do what you're doing in school and to do what you're doing in your workplace and in your home. You have access to greater than what you can actually see with your natural eye. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever stood at the edge of the ocean before, but I grew up on this Atlantic Ocean uh, down in South Carolina on the coast and moved up to Virginia on the coast. And many, many times, hundreds of times, I've stood there on the edge of the ocean looking out. I don't know if you've ever done that. And you're just in awe of, of the vastness. You're in awe looking out over the horizon, how much water is there how much potential power is there, what all's under that water. There's mountains and valleys under that water. There's creatures that you've never seen swimming under that water. There's plant life, and there's all kinds of whole ecosystem taking place there. And then people are really drawn to the ocean, and they don't know one of the reasons they are drawn to it, and they don't even realize it, is those waves, uh, that moving water adds an extra positive connection to our oxygen so the oxygen you breathe there has got a supercharge to it uh, there and in a great forest there are the two places you're going to find that extra charge that is on the oxygen that really helps you and makes you feel better there's just such power there at the ocean but the ocean is but a drop in the bucket in comparison to the holy spirit of god Because the Holy Spirit of God is the one that was creating and has created and sustained the ocean. And uh, the Holy Spirit is not out there for us to wonder uh, his, his depth of knowledge and his depth of power. Jesus said he has sent him to come and live in us, to empower us, to flow through us. So I want us to look at the Holy Spirit's role in Christian ministry this year we've been talking about, uh, you know, getting a stronger core in 24 and how we need to get uh, our core built up in order to have a good posture, in order to have good balance and in order to be able to function better, you have to have a strong core. And this, that's in the physical, but it's also true in the spiritual. We need a strong core. And let me tell you what, at the core of your relationship with God and at the core of your life with God, you must have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. God said through Paul, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but I've given you a spirit of power, power, love, and a sound mind. So it's not by might and it's not by just earthly power, but it's by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you tonight about your role as a servant of God. You have been empowered for service by the Holy Spirit. And I want us to pick up in the scripture about a particular story that took place in the book of Acts chapter 8. We're picking up at verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And he was baptized and he continued with Philip. And he was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Then look at verse uh, 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 16. For as yet he, the Holy Spirit, had not fallen upon any of them. Remember now they've gotten saved, they've been baptized, they've been seeing miracles and signs and wonders but they still had not yet been filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for he had not yet fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
Then they, Paul, uh, Peter, and John, um, Peter and John, laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. Now they're saved, right? They're seeing signs and wonders. They're following Philip. They are all on fire for being used by God to advance the kingdom of God. But when Peter and John show up, they find out, wait a minute, they have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost. They have not yet received the Holy Spirit. They've been baptized uh, in water. They have believed in the name of Jesus Christ. They have placed their faith in him, but they need more. They need more. There's more. There's more. So they lay hands on them and they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 18. And when Simon saw, say Simon saw. Simon. You played the game Simon says. Well, we're doing Simon saw. Okay. When Simon saw, he saw something. There was a manifestation so amazing when they were filled with the Holy Spirit that it got his attention. And the Bible's bringing reference to that here. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power, give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money? You have neither part nor portion with this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this, your wickedness, and pray if God, perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. Pray, he said. Peter, you're talking tough. Peter, you've got my attention, and I don't want any of this to come on me. Why do I bring this story to the, our attention tonight? I believe, as the Holy Spirit has given me this word, is because the one pursuit above all others that the world is after, more than money, more than sex, more than fame, more than position, more than anything, the pursuit of the ages is the pursuit of power. In one form or another, everything this world seeks boils down to the pursuit of power. And here in the book of Acts, we see that Peter uh, and the other apostles are coming on the scene where uh, Philip and all of the new believers are experiencing signs and wonders and miracles after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The power church was birthed and the power church was growing and and this wealthy man named Simon who had achieved a lot of worldly power, as I'm sure his wealth had gained him worldly power, uh, he saw the real power of God flow through the apostles' hands when now he's ready to offer them money so that he can have that power of God as well. And as we just read, Peter, in his own subtle and soft-spoken, kind, tender uh, way, responded, say, may your silver perish with you. Man, Peter knows how to do it uh, for you to even think that you can obtain the gift of God with money. So we see here that the power of God is far more valuable than money. Maybe it was the Spirit of God that prompted Peter to bring this rebuke in such a way to say the power of God will never be tarnished by the dollar. It is not up for bid. It is not up for sale. You will not obtain the power of God through uh, the po politics and the manipulation and the transfer of money. The power that we're talking about, the power of God, the power that birthed the church, the power that grows the church, he's saying is a priceless, it is priceless. And the Lord put on my heart tonight to share with you about the benefits of having the Holy Spirit in your life and how to release the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we release the power of the Holy Spirit, you can see Him working in and through every area of your life. In a sense, there's nothing wrong with us seeking power because God created us to walk in power. Otherwise, He would not be giving us His power to advance His church. However, he never intended for us 
to get the power the way the world does, a corrupt power. We're talking about a holy power. We're talking about a true power. We're talking about a righteous power, that power that heals the sick, that power that, that overcomes every circumstance, that power that puts our enemy to flight, that power that can bring joy and peace and, and prosperity into any circumstance, that power that comes through the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the words of Jesus Christ himself, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And this word power here comes from this Greek word uh, dunamis. And, and dunamis, uh, we get this dunamis here, means power, strength, and a mighty work. And it means the ability to do great and mighty things, uh, the ability to do beyond what you were limited in your own strength. And, and it is where we get our word dynamite from. There is a power that God gives us. Uh, that's why Jesus said, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but I've given you power. I've given you power, love, and a disciplined mind. Uh, it's not by might or the world's power, but by my spirit. And my spirit, when he comes, he brings power from heaven on earth in you to flow through you. And I believe that God throughout the scriptures has built us up to an understanding that we know it is important that we have power. Jesus said, do not even go and, uh, and leave yet. I want you to tarry in Jerusalem, he tells his disciples when he's ascending into the heavens after the resurrection and spending those 40 days here on this earth. And he says, tarry in Jerusalem until you've been endued from on high with power. Uh, remember he said, uh, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the Spirit has fully come, the Bible says there was a sound, a, a great and mighty sound of wind. And, and there come tongues as of fire that set upon each of them. And they were filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. And, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. There was power that was birthed. That power Jesus told them to wait on. That power that Jesus said, I will build my church on that the gates of hell shall not prevail, is now in us, not on us, but in us to flow through us. It's important that we have the power of God. I believe that everybody seeks after power because every negative emotion that we face in our life comes from a sense of powerlessness. When there is a sense of powerlessness, for example, if we don't have the power to change something, it can cause depression. And we go down and our emotions and our mind goes into a dark place because we feel like we're stuck here. We can't get any better. Nothing's ever going to change. If we don't have the power to reconcile a relationship, it causes anger and bitterness. If we don't have the power to get ahead, it can turn into jealousy. Uh, I believe God has created us so that we should operate in power, but not a corrupt worldly power in the power of God. The power is necessary in our lives. Secondly, because every negative circumstance we com face comes from a same sense of powerlessness, the inability to do anything about our situation, the inability to change things. Have you ever been in a situation and you feel like there's no way I can change it, there's no way I've got to live with this the rest of my life? That is a very negative place to be. But when you know that there's a power greater than you, there's a power greater than your circumstances, there's a power greater than the words of men around you, there's a power greater than the authorities who said there's no way. If God says there's a way, yes, he can make a way where there's no way. There is supernatural power. And the Holy Spirit solves our deepest need in our emotions and in our circumstances and frees us from a sense of powerlessness. We read in John chapter 16, verse 13. However, when he, the Holy Spirit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is coming. He has great power. He is the Spirit of God in us. And he's not just to reside in us, but he also wants to walk through us and guide us into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, he'll even tell you things to come. Now, now think about the benefits of knowing what is going to come. Man, that really frees you up, right? You get free from the stress and the fear because now uncertainty is eliminated. You can know what to pray about. You can know how to pray effectively if you will let the Holy Spirit guide you. He, he will tell you things to come. 
You can change the things that the Holy Spirit shows you to change. You can pray against stuff that the enemy is setting up and the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. And it's a great part of our spiritual warfare. You can help others prepare for the future by knowing what is to come. When you read the, whole, uh, the book of Revelation and you let the Holy Spirit guide you, it's no longer a book that brings fear and brings all tra- types of dread. It's an exciting book. It's, he says, blessed that everyone who reads it and hears uh, the reading of it. It's exciting because you see the devil's losing. You're not going to lose. The devil's losing. The, the enemy is losing. It's, it's the final countdown. And, uh, but you who are on the Lord's side, you're winning. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of God shows us that. And I believe the Holy Spirit will show us things that are come, to come uh, that needs changing so that we can pray against it, that we can enter into the battle and be an effective part in spiritual warfare. See, the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God in our lives. We've got to understand that. When God said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, He had the Holy Spirit in mind. He had the Holy Spirit in mind, God with us, God in us, God for us, God flowing through us. God, the Holy Spirit is in us. And when we allow him to operate in our lives the way he desires, there are many things that happen and benefits that come into our life. I want us to just look at several of them tonight. There's no way that we could, in the time allotted, deal with all the benefits that come from having the Holy Spirit freely uh, flowing in us and functioning through us. But let's look at several of them. And the first one I want us to look at, when we allow the Holy Spirit to have liberty to, to dwell in us, we don't grieve Him, we don't quench Him. Uh, it invites, he invites the blessings of God in our household. Because He's living on us, we're living in our household, He has freedom you know, to work in and through us. The presence of the Lord is now in your home. The presence of the Lord is in your home. Some people want to come and they want to dance with the Holy Spirit at church and think that, you know, they're at the prom with the Holy Ghost and uh, he's the celebrity and then they go home and they leave him. The Holy Spirit does not want you to come and just to worship him and, and, and to celebrate his presence corporately. He wants to live in you. He wants to go home with you. The same Holy Spirit that is in here is the same Holy Spirit that wants to be in your home. The same Holy Spirit with his, his power. And he invites the blessing of God into your household. How many of you remember the story in 2 Samuel chapter 6 when uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which was the Ark of God's presence, uh, you remember it was stolen by the Philistines. And, uh, and, and now uh, all kinds of curses are breaking out and boils are breaking out. And all, I, I don't want to go into all the details of some of the grossness of what was happening but they got to get rid of this thing. They don't want it anymore. Uh, they said, y'all got to come get it. And uh, so David goes and they go to get the Ark of the Covenant. And you remember they put it in an ox cart, a Philistine ox cart. God had given specific instructions how to carry his presence. You were to carry his presence with the rods that went through the, the holes that were set upon uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And they were to be set upon the priest's shoulders and carried in a certain way. But here they've got it on a Philistine ox cart and it hits a bump and it uh, goes to fall over and one of David's men uh, touches it to steady it to keep it from falling and he drops dead. And, and David gets upset. He's, you know, he's mad at God. God, here, I'm, he's not looking at all of what led up to the, the Ark of the Covenant being with the, uh, in the Philistines' camp and all that the failures that they had done and how things they had done uh, uh, shortchange their, their servitude to God. They're moving and leaving all of that. And uh, all he's now is just mad because his man died and he's just trying to help out, even though he's violating what God had said in how to handle the Ark of the Covenant. So David says, we're not taking the Ark back to the city. We're going to leave it over here at Obed-Edom's house. So he leaves it at Obed-Edom's house and then he gets back to Jerusalem And the months pass by, month one, month two, month three, and all he can hear is about how Obed-Edom's household is being blessed. He's being blessed. Everything they touch is being blessed. The children are blessed. The the dogs are blessed. The donkeys are blessed. Everything is blessed. And, And David said, wait a minute now. 
We left the presence of the Lord there, and where the presence of the Lord is, the presence of the Lord invites the blessing. We need the blessing in Jerusalem. And that's when he goes back to Obed-Edom's house, and now they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, back to Jerusalem. And so many feet, he's stopping, and he's having oxen slain, and they're worshiping, and they're singing, and they're praising, and they're offering sacrifices all on their journey from Obed-Edom's house back to Jerusalem. And David's so worked up that he's got his royal robes off, he's stripped down, and he's dancing before the Lord. And you know the story of his wife, uh, Michael, she's looking down and gets and says what she says because uh, she's looking at it as a distasteful thing that he, the king, is acting such a way. But David, he said, I'm, I'm worshiping the true king. I'm stripping my royal garb off because I'm worshiping the true king. Uh, and, and I know we need the presence of the Lord. We need the blessing of the Lord. And they brought, and then he sets up his tent and says 24 hours a day. I don't know if you, any of you ever heard of David's tent ministry. It goes 24 hours. You can go on the mall at D.C. and see 24 hours there doing worship there. Had done it for years. We've had them here do some 24-hour sessions as well. Uh, that's where that comes from because David set up the tent and put in the Ark of the Covenant and there he said, I want worshipers 24-7. God deserves all because the blessing of the Lord comes with the, with the presence of the Lord. Well, let me tell you what, if you've got the Holy Spirit living in you, let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is inviting the blessing of God into your body, the blessing of God into your home, the blessing of God into your workplace, into the school that you attend. That's why the Bible says that everywhere the soles of your feet shall tread, there you will establish the blessing of the Lord that the blessing of the Lord is on your hand, that everything you put your hand to would be blessed. It's not because you're blessed, it's because you're housing the blessing of the Lord through the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. You need to say, welcome Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve you. I don't want to quench you. You, Spirit of the living God, great power, wisdom, and knowledge, and all that you are, God's presence in me, usher in the blessing in my household. How many of you need the blessing of the Lord in your household? Well, when you walk it through the door tonight, you say, I'm coming in, but the Holy Spirit's coming in as well. And the Holy Spirit is King of kings, Lord of lords. The Holy Spirit is the numero uno. The Holy Spirit is God. And what he wants in this house is what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. Second thing the Holy Spirit does, a benefit, is he opens up fellowship with God. He opens up fellowship with God. In Exodus 25 and 22, the Bible says, there God says, I will meet you and I will speak with you there at the mercy seat, right there between the two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. So we're again talking about the Ark of the Covenant because God gave that to us to show us as a symbol and an example of his presence, how to handle his presence, how when his presence is present, what happens? So now he has given us his presence in and by his Holy Spirit. So we are now, we're the, we're, the Bible says, know you not that your body is now the temple of the Holy Ghost. So now the Holy Spirit of God it dwells in us as he dwelt in that Ark of the Covenant. There is the presence of God. And, and, God, and they said, there I will meet you here between the cherubim of the Ark of the Testimony. Here is my presence. Let me tell you what, if you ever want to feel the presence of the Lord, draw near to the Holy Spirit. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Start talking to the Holy Spirit. Start listening to the Holy Spirit. Listen to God in you. Hallelujah. Because let me tell you why, uh, you, will, you will be opened up to the fellowship and communication and community with God. And God can do more with you and for you uh, in those few moments that you're fellowshipping with him than if you were to spend hours and hours with counselors and friends and family and other people. Uh, let me tell you what, God is a God who created us and when we fellowship with him, he empowers us. Another one of the benefits we find is he gives supernatural guidance to us from God because he is God. Uh, remember in Exodus 40, chapter 36 and moving on, Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they, would, they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. 
For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night, in the sight of all of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So they learned when they were coming out of Egypt and they were traveling across the wilderness into the promised land, and because of their unbelief and they're now wandering around the mountains for something that should have taken less than two weeks is now going to take them 40 years because that generation of unbelievers, God said, I'm going to wait till they die off and a new generation I will take into the promised land. But if they were to get the sustenance from God, if they were to get the manna from heaven from God, if they were to experience the miraculous water that came out of the rocks that, that quenched their thirst of millions of people and their livestock, they had to stay in the presence of the Lord. And God there again with the, with the Ark of the Covenant and there above it in the tabernacle of meeting where the Ark of the Covenant was, by day a cloud was over it and by night a pillar of fire. And whenever God wanted to, at any time he decided, he would move the cloud or he would move the pillar of fire. They were to pack up and they were to go where the pillar was, a fire or the cloud, whether it was at night or day. When God moved, they moved with God. When God moved, they moved with God. And as God gave them the guidance by the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night over the Ark of the Covenant as it was moving... Uh, they were guided by him to the next place that they would receive their manna and receive their water and at one time even quell from the heavens. So God guided them supernaturally. And it's hot in the desert at, in the day and a cloud provided them shade and cooled things down. And then at night the desert gets very cold and a fire provides heat as well as it gets dark, it provides light. So God is giving them all of the provision they would need, but they had to follow him in order to experience uh, day by day the provision of God. Oh, that we would learn to do the same thing. Oh, that we would discipline ourselves to say, God, wherever you move there, I want to follow you. Whatever you want me to do, that I will do. God, whatever you want me to say, that I will say. God, whatever you don't want me to say, that I will bite my tongue. That, God, I want you to guide me. I don't want my emotions to guide me. I don't want my uh, memory to guide me. I don't want my intellect to guide me. I don't want my peers to guide me. God, I want to be guided by you. You care about every hair that is numbered on my head. You care about me. And, Lord, I want to learn to live in such a way that I am guided by your Holy Spirit. One of the benefits of the Holy Spirit in our life, he empowers us with supernatural guidance. People ask me so many times, why are you in Hampton Roads? You grew up in South Carolina. You weren't, you weren't born in Virginia. And you're one of those South Carolina boys. Get back. I, well, I've been told that before. You need to go back south. You need to go back south. And I'm like, I'm not here on your dime. I'm not here on your invitation. I'm not here on your orders. I have a commanding officer, and my commanding officer said, pack it up, and I want you to go to Hampton Roads, and I want you to plant a church, and until he tells me to stop pastoring it, then I'm going to be right there. I have nowhere else to go but to obey him. And people say, well, then a year, some of those that did that years ago have come back to me and apologized and said, I'm so sorry. I was kind of rough with you. I felt like we had too many churches in Hampton Roads. I'm like, what's this young whippersnapper coming in here with that southern draw going to do in, 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 in Hampton Roads? And what, we don't need another church here. And uh, we don't need this. We don't need that. He says, I do apologize. And I'm so sorry. And now that I see you, you and your family and you're all so blessed, I see the hand of God is on your life. Uh, please forgive me. And I was more than welcome. I said, you know, I'd actually forgot about it. They reminded me of something I'd forgot about. And I said, most definitely, I forgive you. And uh, I said, but you know, I'm just on the marching orders of the Lord. That's the greatest place to be. To do and be where God wants you, not where, you're, you, where you think would be cool to hang out or where you think uh, this would be uh, an adventure to do. You want to be right where God wants you to be. And the Holy Spirit will tell you. He will tell you. If he told them in the wilderness uh, and showed them at night and by day, God is not sleeping on this. He is alert and awake, and he'll do the same for you. Night or day, he will give you the guidance you need if you will seek it from him. 
There are benefits in serving God. There are benefits in being filled with the Holy Spirit. There are benefits in being uh, guided by the Spirit of God. Another one, I love this benefit here, is it melts like, uh, the Bible says it melts like wax, the hard to move mountains in your life. It melts like wax, the hard to move. I love that picture language the Lord has drawn here. I don't know if any of you have ever gotten a birthday cake before. I used to get them with a few candles on it, and it wasn't much to blow them out. But now when they put all the candles on it, it's more wax than it is cake. And, uh, and sometimes it takes a couple of huffs and puffs to blow it all out. And the wax is quickly melting down, and, and they're like, Dad, Dad, blow it out. Hurry, 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 before we get all the wax on the cake. And I'm like, why'd y'all put all these 50-plus candles on here, you know? Uh, because the wax, it just starts, it's a little flame, but it doesn't take much heat to well, melt the wax. So God uses that picture of this, this mountain that's standing in front of you, this problem, this sickness, this bondage, this lie, whatever it is that's standing in front of you, staring you down, and this situation seems like an immovable mountain. God says, invite my presence, invite, my pre invite the Holy Spirit, and when I come in by my spirit, your mountains will melt like wax. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. And the psalmist said in Psalms 97 and 5, the mountains melt like wax in the presence of the Lord and the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. So if you've got a mountain, there's two things you can do to mountains, okay? The Bible, Jesus says, speak to your mountain. You can speak to your mountain, right? You got to have faith. You got to have faith. You got to have faith in God's word. You got to have faith that he's given you the authority over all the power of the enemy that by your words, life and death, and there's blessing and curses by the power of your tongue. And then you speak to your mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and it will have to obey. Another thing is just, just come to the foot of the mountain and begin to worship the Lord. Begin to pray in the Spirit. Begin to sing in the Spirit. You can sing. You can do like the, uh, they did around the walls of Jericho. You can just march around. Really, all you got to do is bring in the usher in the presence of the Lord. Did they have to take one axe? Did they have to take one sledgehammer? Did they have to take one jackhammer to the walls of Jericho? Not one. Not one. Not one pick. Not one. Because the power of God caused that mountain to melt like wax before them. All they were is obeying the Lord and ushering in the presence of the Lord. Some of us need to learn to do the same thing. We need to come to some mountains. Anybody got any mountains? Those stubborn things, those stubborn things. You prayed over it, you've spoken to it, you've kicked it. You, you, you've taken a vehicle and run into the side of it. You've tried to take a natural dynamite and blow it up. You're frustrated with that mountain. How about just take some time and say, I'm ushering in the presence of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord. And you just start walking around that mountain praying in the Spirit. Just walking around that mountain. Get your good uh, music going, some worship music, some soaking music, and just start praying in the Spirit. Just start praying in the Spirit. Oh, you won't even break a sweat. You won't have to take out an axe. You won't have to take out a sledgehammer. You won't even have to take out a jackhammer. No, the Bible says the presence of the Lord, the presence of the Lord will cause that mountain to melt like wax. I take God at his word. I take God at his word. And he's never, ever failed me yet. Hallelujah. So that's one of the benefits of the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit in you. Remember, we open up with Simon the Sorcerer wanting to buy this power, wanting to buy the presence of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and Peter, so but not but so kindly, rebukes him and tells him he needs to perish, thinking you can buy something so powerful and precious with, with corrupt money. No, this is God. This is the presence of God. God wants to come and dwell in us and flow through us. He wants your body to be his temple he wants the Holy of Holies in you. He wants to place the Holy of Holies in you, His presence in you. Oh, you just got to welcome Him. You just got to welcome Him in. Another thing that the Holy Spirit does is He comes in, He ushers in joy and laughter and pleasure. Some of you need a dose of this even tonight. Some of you hadn't laughed long. Some of you hadn't laughed in a long time. Some of you hadn't laughed in a long time. The Bible says, laughter doeth the heart good like medicine. The devil's trying to kill you. The devil's trying to give you shorter years in your heart. 
uh, by keeping you from laughing. You're too serious. You're too serious. You're too stuck on something. You're too focused on something. So if somehow or another you think your power is the only power that's available to get you out of the mess you're in. Some of you got to release that right now. You got to repent like, like Simon the sorcerer did and say, God, forgive me. I, I'm, I'm going to lean on your power, Lord God. I'm going to yield to your power. And, and when you do, it lightens you up. It frees you from all of that stress and anxiety of thinking you've got to fix it in your own strength. Am I talking to anybody here tonight that's been, you've been, you've been working, working it, working it. I don't know if you've ever changed a tire on a car, especially an old rusty car or tractor. And I remember one time I spent, seemed like half a day trying to get the lug nut off of an old rusted tractor so I could change the t- tire. And I took the longest, uh, 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 you know, I took the longest wrench I had and then I even put a pipe on the end of it and I got on it and I'm standing on it, jumping, trying to, to get it off and I couldn't break it loose and it just went on and on and I was so frustrated. And then my uncle pulls up in his work truck and he says, what you doing? And he called me by my nickname, of which I will not tell you what it was. And uh, he called me by my nickname and he said, what you doing? And I said, Uncle, I'm trying to get this last, l- I got them all off of this one. I can't break it. I can't do it. And he looked at me and he said, you are wore out. I am sweating. I am, I am give out. I need a break. I need a Kit Kat break or something other. I just tell you what. And, uh, and he says, uh, don't worry about it. He goes to the back of the truck and he grabs uh, one of those air impact wrenches and he's got an air tank on that work truck. And he goes over there and just puts it on it and goes, brrr, and it pops it right off. And I'm like, I've spent half a day. Where were you at? Well, some of us are trying to do life like I was trying to do that tire. And my uncle represents the Holy Spirit. He wants to do it for you. All you got to do is invite him in. Invite him into the situation. Invite him into the problem. And let me tell you what, he will take the anxiety and the pressure off of you. Hallelujah. And then you can have joy and laughter and play. I didn't feel like laughing when I was so wore out. I didn't feel like there was any joy in my life. And it surely wasn't pleasurable. But let me tell you what. Uh, when we got to the other side of the tractor, and I think it probably had 10, 10 on it, I didn't touch it one. And he went on that side and took them all off. And boy, I was I feeling good. I was feeling mighty, mighty good. And I, to this day, I still feel good. Hallelujah. Psalm, Psalm 16 and 11 says, You will show me the path of life. Your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalms 21 and 6, he says, For you have made him most blessed for it forever. You made him exceedingly glad with your presence. So if you've lost your joy, if you've lost your laughter, if you've lost the pleasure of living, you, that means you have abandoned the presence of the Lord. Now, you may still have your religious T-shirt on. You may still have your religious hat on. You may have your religious uh, you know, intellect of, of declaring uh, your, your, your creeds and so forth. But let me tell you what, you don't have the presence of the Lord. See, the, you can have all that. You can even do mighty things in the name of God. And Jesus say, I never knew you. But didn't we heal the sick in your name? Didn't we cast out devils in your name? He says, depart from me. I never knew you. You can do a lot of religious stuff in the name of the Lord. But I'm talking about the presence of the Lord. Not the religion of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. And you can know that his presence in his presence is fullness of joy. The anxiety will be driven away. The, the, the pain, the fear, the, the, all of that, that that drains you will be driven away. You'll laugh again. You'll laugh again. <laughs> I tell you what, I, I've got, I got a lot on my plate. But Pastor Radik is always saying, what is, I'm always laughing at something. And I just, and she's learned to laugh at it whether she understands it or not because I'm one of those, I'll explain it until you understand it. And if she doesn't understand it when I'm trying to explain it, then I'll keep explaining it. So she's learned really early on, she just laughs. I don't know if she gets any of them, but she just, she's a good trooper. She just laughs. And I think she's laughing a lot at me and I'm laughing at her knowing that she's laughing because she really may not even understand. And we just have a good time, a good time. Praise the Lord. But I tell you, the children of God should be the most joyous people on planet Earth. 
We should, we should have the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? And the enemy knows how to rob us of our strength. Oh, you don't have to find some crude uh, 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 humor to laugh at. That to me is not even funny. That is disgusting. That is degrading. You don't need to look at that. But when you've got the presence of the Lord, you start finding joy in the smallest of things. You start seeing uh, uh, the, the fun in life in areas that you've been missing. Some of you have been too serious. I'm telling you right now. Some of you are too serious. I don't know if you wear too tight of underwear or what, but you're too serious. You need to up the size, free yourself up a little bit. And stop being so stuck up. You need to free up. We are children of God. How many of you know when uh, you walk up to someone that's growling or a dog that's growling, do you want to jump down there and play with that dog? No, but if you see a little puppy and it's bouncing and licking and, and smiling with its tail wagging and smiling with its face, you just can't help but go down and just you start playing and getting giggly with that little thing. Well, a lot of you are like the snarling, growling dog. And you're like, I'm a child of God. And people are like, whoa, if that's what being a child of God is, I'm going, maybe I'm going to pick, I'm going to go to the side over here and get me a cat, you know, uh, or a gerbil or a fish or a bird. Man, man, we're representing Christ. Man, why can't we have the joy? And I'm not talking about a fabricated joy. I'm talking about what God says right here. Joy that comes from him. Now, he will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. God says that because that's important. You having the joy of the Lord is important. If the joy of the Lord is our strength, a lot of us are so weak because we don't have that joy. And that joy comes from his presence. And he has given his presence to dwell in us in and by his Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And then another benefit we see in having the Holy Spirit abide in us as he causes our enemy to fall and perish. Psalms 9 and 3, when my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. Hallelujah. Remember the time God said, send out the worshipers. You got a, a mighty army all gathered together, nations gathered together, and they have in their mind destroy Israel destroy the children of God, destroy them. And they've got everything in their mind set to do that. They have the, pull, they pull together, they have the numbers on their side. They have the weapons of excellence on their side. They have the advantage of positioning on their side. And God, I love God. I just love God. God, nothing threatens God. Nothing threatens God. God says, here's what we're gonna do. I want you to send the praise and worship team out. Send the choir out. Let's just send them out. And anybody that's ever fought a battle knows that someone with a flute and a lyre and a harp and somebody with a pretty voice is not going to stand up against a sword and a javelin and uh, bow and arrows and all of that stuff. It's just not going to stand up in the natural. But God said, you've got my power on your side. You've got my presence on your side. And they sent out the praise and worship team and the choir and the enemy, they don't know what happened, but the enemy turned on themselves and destroyed themselves and they didn't even have to fight. They didn't even have to fight. See, sometimes your victory is just in you singing. Your victory is just in you humming. Your victory is just in you whistling. You say, well, I don't know how to whistle. Learn how to whistle. Just learn how to whistle. Whistle a tune for the Lord. Hallelujah. Just praise the Lord. I'm telling you. My, he said, the enemies turn back. They fall and perish at the presence of the Lord. So you got an enemy against your health. You got an enemy against your mind. You got an enemy against your wealth. You got an enemy against your soul. You got an enemy against your family. Oh, what you need to do is you need to usher in the presence of the Lord. Because the presence, and, and, and I keep saying singing because God gives us this, this formula uh, that he said I operate by. He says, I inhabit the praises of my people. And that word inhabit, if Joshua, is the Hebrew word where it means I move my presence, I move my presence into your midst where there's praise. I'm attracted to the praise. 
Where you worship me, there I my presence will be. What happens where his presence is? The enemy fall and they perish. In his presence, there's joy. There's laughter. There's, there's, there's victory. The mountains melt like wax. So we got to learn. We got to learn to usher in the presence of the Lord. We got to learn. We don't need. We don't need a fancy keyboard, and we don't need a fancy uh, uh, anything. Because God didn't say when you get the keyboard right, then that's real worship that moves me. David. David was doing it out uh, with just a little, what we would call a little lyre, little harp there, a little lyre. He had uh, kind of like a, what is a mandolin or something like that. We would have. What's the little ones? Ukulele, anybody can play a ukulele. (laughs) Cool thing is, I don't play any of that stuff. I just lift up my hands and I play my vocal cords. And I just play those for the Lord. And he just, his presence, he yashab, he moves in uh, his presence. Stop feeling like you got to fight everything. Let God fight your battle. Stop feeling like you got to fix everything. Let the mighty power of God transform it. All you need to do is usher in his presence. Hallelujah. The presence of the Holy Spirit. And then the final one I have here is usher in times of refreshing and restoration. In Acts 3 and 19, he says, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Oh, we need your presence, Holy Spirit. We need your presence. Where the presence of the Lord is, there's times of refreshing. He brings laughter. He brings joy. He brings victory. He brings healing. He brings provision. He brings the blessing. All we need is his presence. And he says there was a time that my presence was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And you had to come to the Ark of the Covenant between the cherubim in order to be in my presence. He says, but now that my son has come and redeemed mankind for those that have been washed in the blood and redeemed by the precious blood of the Lamb. He said, now I have chosen to make you, to make you the temple where my presence will dwell. That is, I brought the Holy Spirit, my presence, on Samson and on the judges and so forth. I will bring my presence in you to dwell in you, to abide in you. But he says you can grieve him. He says that you can quench him. And if you grieve him and quench him, you are quenching the presence of the Lord. We need to celebrate the Holy Spirit. We need to... uh, uh, Free our, our, our grip off of the, our life, saying it's not by might, not by my power, but it's by the Spirit. Spirit, you can fix this. Spirit, you can heal this. Spirit of God, you can deliver this. Spirit of God, you can drive this demonic force away. Spirit of God, you can usher in joy and, and pleasure forevermore. So I want to give you some practical steps now. Get out your hammer. Get out your tool belt. You've got some DIY going on here. Do it yourself. DIY. How to release his power and presence in your life. How to do that. So first, very simple, by your words. By your words. As we speak the word of God out of our mouth on a regular basis, the Holy Spirit has not only given us the word, The Holy Spirit is not only the author of the Word, the Holy Spirit is the breath of God that when we read the Word, we are literally moving the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is moving on our words when we speak the Word, when we read the Word. The Word is powerful. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's powerful. It can pierce even to the vision of, of spirit and soul because... It is the Holy Spirit with us. It is the Spirit of God bringing the Word, Jesus Christ, the provision, and everything that we have in us and for us. So when we speak the Word of God out of our mouths on a regular basis, the Holy Spirit takes these words and He brings them to pass. He brings them to pass. You remember in the beginning, the Bible says everything was, uh, it was uh, without form and void and, and darkness covered the, the face of the deep. And, and the Bible says that the, the Holy Spirit hovered over that. So the Holy Spirit, like a dove, was hovering over the darkness, over the void. 
And then God said a word, let there be light. And when he said, let there be light, the Holy Spirit takes, as he is God, he is the function of God that takes the word and makes it reality. So when Father God said, let there be light, Holy Spirit makes it light here on this earth. Same is true with anything in God's word. When you take and speak the word, you align your tongue with the word of God and you speak it in faith. The Holy Spirit takes that word and brings it to manifest. That's why all the promises of God are yes and amen. Didn't say some of them. All of them are because the Holy Spirit is not going to pick and choose. He's the one gave us all the promises and he's ready to bring those promises to manifest if our faith will align up with him because without faith, you can't please God. Anything done out of faith, not in faith, is sin. So, so we don't do religious uh, sorcery and taking the word and like throwing it like magic dust or something like that. We align our heart with the Word of God, saying this is the Word of God, this is Holy Inspired, Holy Spirit, you've given it to me, Holy Spirit, you're in me, now I speak it and I know what you're going to do, you're going to take it and you're going to make it manifest, I believe and thus I speak and I will see it, and now your faith is speaking for the Word that the Holy Spirit will bring to pass. That's why I say if you ever need a miracle from God, find a promise in the Word, there's over 7,000 in there, for that particular situation, Hold on to that promise and begin to speak that from promise in faith. And then you will see the Holy Spirit begin to work. Acts 10 and 44 says that while he spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all that were listening. So there he went and he's speaking the word of God. And as he speaks the word, the Holy Spirit moves and, 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 and falls on all these people that were listening. So we, we got power in our words. Now don't go negate it. By saying, well, you know, I've tried that before and it didn't happen. Or I don't really know if that, that's how it works. Or I, I don't know that I believe. Or, you know, I, I, I was born with this. This is generational. It, is God not stronger and more powerful than something generational? Come on now. So don't negate it with words of doubt and unbelief. Let's speak the word in faith. And then number two you release the power of the Holy Spirit in His presence by obeying God. By obeying God. You may say, well, I'm in disobedience tonight. I would say repent. That's the only way to come from under disobedience is to repent. We are witnesses of these things, the Bible says, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Who obey Him. See, it may be that God's told you to do something and you failed to do it, yet you're wanting God to do something else for you and he's not moving. See, God doesn't, he doesn't play our games. He says, he says, if you're not willing to go and do what I've asked you to do already, why should I give you another instruction? Well, and, and I'm not your play toy and I'm not your, I'm not your Santa Claus and I'm not your, your spoiled, spoiled parent that's going to spoil you that you can uh, whip me up with your emotions or your tantrum. No, I'm God. I'm God. And, and I told you to do this and you still haven't done it. So I'm not giving you any instruction over here until you get over here and do that. And, and you know, we need to walk in obedience. That's discipleship. Discipleship is coming hypostasis under the, the, the guidance and the, and the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's why to get saved, you have to declare Jesus Christ is your Lord. Didn't say you declare he's your savior. He's your savior. He saves you when you declare his lordship. A lot of people say, yeah, Jesus is my savior. And they've never surrendered to his lordship. And really and truly, they're not. They're not even saved. Because he says you've got to believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that God is alive and Jesus Christ is here. And now you've got to declare that he is your Lord. Look at Romans 10, 9 and 10. It tells you very simply, declare his lordship, which means I surrender my will, I surrender my life under his guidance and his leadership. And then you shall be so, though. You shall be saved. Just calling him Savior doesn't make you saved. I mean, let's get real. Let's get real. Calling him Savior doesn't... Yielding to his lordship gets you saved. 
Amen. Amen. Let me move on before it gets, before I have to fight somebody in here tonight. Okay. Here's another way to release the power and presence of the Holy Spirit is by giving to God. Giving to God. Acts 10 and 3, about the ninth hour of the day, Cornelius saw clearly a vision of an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So the angel of God said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. God sends an angel to Cornelius to tell Cornelius that you got my attention with your prayers and your continual giving of alms. Your giving and your prayers got my attention. Now, why in the world would God do that and record it unless he wants us to know tonight that we get the attention of God, that we get his attention when we uh, regularly bring alms unto him and we bring prayers unto him, that he takes note of that. They come before him, your prayers and your alms, as a memorial before God. It was through his giving that the gospel was brought to his household in his non-Jewish world. It was through his giving. Remember, he was a, he was a Gentile. And Peter comes to his household, and he's a Gentile. And, uh, and you see that in this chapter, Cornelius becomes the first Gentile believer... And he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. So the angel of the Lord says, what's happening in your house? I'll tell you why it's happening. Because you've been praying and you've been giving to God. Your gifts to God and your prayers to God has been set as a memorial before you. Now, salvation is coming to your whole house. Hallelujah. How exciting is that? I'm so glad that we can participate in, in the interaction with God, and it's not just, does God, is God going to show up or not? Is God going to do anything or God? Is God, wait, wait, for you who are watching, listening as a podcast, I'm just wetting my finger and putting it up to the air, like which way is the wind blowing? Which way is the, you don't have to live with this uh, ambiguity like that. You can engage, you can engage with God in these ways that I'm showing you uh, so that you will see God begin to move in a mighty way. And as a result of Cornelius and his whole household getting saved, the entire region of that world opened up to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was through the Gentiles that the word came to us even today. Thank God for Cornelius. Thank God for his giving and his prayers. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the fourth thing, and I'll close with this one, is praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 and 2, For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So get over it. Well, you know, you know what, what will people think? You're not talking to people. God says, do you want to talk to me or not? Do you want to talk to me or not? God says, I've got a language by which we can communicate. For no one understands him because it wasn't for man. However, in the Spirit, he speaks mysteries or secret counsels of God. But he now who prophesies, now he's speaking in the language of the people, he speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. But he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Say that with me. Edifies himself. That's very important. But he who prophesies edifies the church. So we're not talking about a prophetic word coming for the church. We're not talking about a message for the house. We're talking about you talking to God, spirit to spirit. As we pray in tongues, we are speaking to God and the Holy Spirit is strengthening, strengthening us. You said it with me. It edifies you. You are being edified. So what that word edify means is okereomeo uh, is the Greek word and it means to be built up. It means to build anything, to restore anything, to repair anything, to embolden anything. So he says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but you're speaking to God. And then he says, it, when you're speaking to God, spirit to spirit, a miracle takes place. You're being built up. You're being restored. You're being repaired. You're being emboldened as you, as you pray in the spirit. 
That's why Jesus, it's the same word Jesus used in Matthew 7 and 24 when he says, you know, like a man who builds his house on a rock. There, there's the same word of okerodomio uh, is that same word of building a house on a rock. It's the same Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 18 when he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. Same word used there to build anything, to restore anything, to repair anything, to embolden anything. So when you pray in the spirit, now this is not the manifestation gift of tongues with interpretation that chapter 12, 1 Corinthians talks about. That is for unbelievers, the Bible says. A prophetic word is for the believer. A word in tongues with interpretation, that is a manifestation gift that is for unbelievers. It's a way God gets their attention. And, and, that, that, and that interpreted word probably will speak directly to them and really get the, every, every hair standing up on their neck and gets their attention that, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's happening here is supernatural. That's a manifestation gift for the body. And you shouldn't have more than two or three in a service, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians. He gives us some instruction. We're not talking about the manifestation gift of that for the body. Paul is talking about this. He says, you're not talking to men. You're not talking to men. Remember, we just looked at that. He said, when you pray in this way, uh, you do not speak to men, but you're speaking to God. So he's talking about you praying in the Spirit now, not a manifestation of a message for the, for the body. This is praying in the Spirit. And he also goes on to say, you can sing in the Spirit. You can sing in the Spirit. You can pray in the Spirit. He said, I do it more than all of you. I wish you all would pray in the Spirit. I wish you all would sing in the Spirit. So you would be talking to God. And when you talk to God, you're not talking to man. You're talking to God. You are edified. You are edified. A, the contractor of God that created the heavens and the earth, God in his building capacity, in his restoring capacity, and his repairing capacity is, is walking through us to, do, uh, to build us up and strengthen us. And the weak places are made strong. And he's adding new stories to us all the time. He's making high rises out of us. Hallelujah. Because we're going from glory to glory and faith to faith. And you're being emboldened by the Spirit of God when you pray in the Spirit. So we need to understand that we, how do we get the Holy Spirit moving in us and through us? That fourth one is praying in the Spirit. We read in um, uh, Romans 8 and 26, likewise the Spirit helps in our weaknesses. So he, remember he comes in to build and repair. The Holy Spirit comes in, he helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows the, what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So as we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit is praying God's perfect will into our spirit so that now we walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh so that we know how to walk out. We don't, even, we don't know exactly how to get out of this mess, but as we pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit brings forth the perfect will of God revealed in our spirit man. And now just like the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night begins to move, now we know which way to go by divine uh, connection rather than intellectual understanding. And God can supernaturally guide us. And lead us. See, the will of God in heaven begins to penetrate and invade here on earth when we pray in the Spirit, our heavenly language. Our heavenly language is powerful. Our heavenly language is powerful. One of the armor that God gives us with you to put on the whole armor of God. If you go through the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness and the belt of truth and the shoes preparation with the gospel of peace and the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith, uh, quenching all the fiery darts, praying always in the spirit is part of your armor. It's part of spiritual warfare. I'm going to drop something on you. I know we've, we've gone over a few minutes here. It's wet outside. Let's just, it's dry in here. Let's just take, take advantage of that. Okay. I want you to think about something. I want you to think about something. Just think about it. This is, this is something like the Holy Spirit showed me. After the flood, Genesis 9. Remember, after the flood, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. What did he say do? 
Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. That's after the flood. Noah and his sons and their, daughter, and their wives. Okay? Two, later, two chapters later, in Genesis 11, but the Lord came down to see that the city uh, with the tower which the sons of men had built, and the Lord said, Indeed, the people who are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Why? Because they had one language. They had one language. Now you say, what language was that? Uh, let, me, let, me, let me hold on to that thought and let me go forward. So let us, God says, there's the Trinity spoken of there. You've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You've got us. Let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So there, there, that was the, you know, their Tower Babel. And they began to separate into what they could understand. Just showing you the power of language. Showing you the power of language. Now, I want you to look at Zephaniah. Probably hadn't been to Zephaniah in a long time, but you can go at it right now. Uh, prophecy of a pure language restored. The, the prophet is saying in Zephaniah 3 and 9, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Now, does that, that, that ring a bell with anybody? Look at Acts 2 and 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord. So the prophecy is going to be fulfilled that that one language that they had, they could do anything. God said they could do anything. Let us go in and separate them and give them a lesser languages but because this powerful language has so much power, they can, nothing will be withheld from them. So he, but the prophet said, I'm going to restore that pure language. I'm going to restore it. And when I do, he says, uh, they will serve him with one accord. Now in Acts chapter 2, at our birthday, say our birthday, our birthday, the church. There was no church before this. This is when we're born. Jesus said, tarry until you've been endued from on high with what? Power. After that, that my Holy Spirit has come. So the Holy Spirit is bringing this power. On the day of Pentecost, they fully come. They were with one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared unto them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Could it not, could it be that that restoration of a pure language of that which they were able to build this tower into the heavens because that unity that it brought, uh, that power that it united uh, is now brought back to us, the church, because Jesus said, I'll build my church on the, on a, uh, on the, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And my anointing will, by my spirit being present in them and flowing through them, will advance my kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. Let me tell you what. I grew up in a denomination that was anti-tongues. That's what I grew up with. And there was anti-power and led me to suicide. But thank God for the right hand of God that saved my life and said there's more. And then as I pursued more, I found out that there's a God that will move on the inside of us by his spirit. And he'll bring the power that created the heavens and the earth to abide in us and flow through us. The wisdom of the heavens to guide us and direct us. And the anointing of God to set us free. Hallelujah. Oh, let me say to you, you can release his power and his presence by your words, by obeying him, by giving to God and by praying in the spirit. Oh, I encourage you as we go forth from this place tonight that you would never forget this word. That you are empowered for service. That God has put you here for, for this, such a time as this. And he's given you access to his power. And the Holy Spirit will bring forth that in and through the, for ministry for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this word tonight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord God, that we're going to leave here. Lord God, reminded of who we are and whose we are and who you are and what you've done and who, how you set yourself in us, Lord God, and how we can allow you to flow through us, Lord God. Lord, that greater things, greater things that you said that, that we would do uh, as we would come forth in your name, Lord God, and by your Spirit, that we begin to let you, Holy Spirit, begin to do those greater things in us and through us, that we would 
would yield to you, Holy Spirit, that we would call on you, Holy Spirit, that we would find ourselves relaxing and worshiping and, and abiding in the vine and enjoying your presence, Lord, so that your joy and your laughter and your peace can fill our hearts and our minds and that we know, Holy Spirit, you're guiding our every step. We don't have to be in worry. We don't have to live with anxiety. We don't have to live in fear, but we can live in power. Hallelujah. Power. And we can, Lord God, we can have that love and that sound mind that you promised us in your word. Lord, as we take your word tonight, I pray, God, that we would take it, we would uh, meditate upon it, that we would ruminate on it, Lord God, and we would get all of the truth of that which you have for us so that we could walk by your words in such a way to bring glory and honor to you. Lord, I thank you for your people here tonight. I thank you that we've come to study your word. Now you said uh, we would go forth in your blessings and your protection in your favor. We go now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for your patience. Got you. I took you over about 10 minutes. Uh, don't take it out of my hide. But God bless you as you go.